Uh, it's been a few weeks since we've been here, uh, but uh, we're going to pick up uh, in Matthew chapter 11. Just a few reminders as we are going through the book of Matthew. The overall theme of the book is uh, that Jesus is the King. And uh, we have been studying from about chapter 8 on in the ministry of the Master, the, uh, the King's uh, work here on earth. And uh, from about the, the end of the um, Sermon on the Mount, we've seen the King's authority. Uh, that was something that he declared, and he preached as one having authority throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And then after that, he began to demonstrate his authority. We see his authority over disease. We see it over demons. Uh, we see it over death. Jesus Christ is the authority. And uh, here in Matthew chapter number 11, uh, there were several things about the king. Remember, even as Jesus was on earth, he had a message that he went about preaching. And that message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was an invitation to join his kingdom. But as we saw the last time we were in Matthew chapter number 11, uh, there are the majority who would reject his authority, his invitation, they scorn his kingdom, and there's uh, a consequence that comes with that. If you're not in the kingdom of God, then you're in the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the devil. Uh, if you are not one who has life through the Son, uh, then you are one who finds death uh, with the enemy. And uh, in this passage in Matthew chapter number 11, we're going to look at verse number 20 down to verse number 24 tonight, and we will see uh, what takes place with those who reject the king. And uh, there's a lot of lessons really in these verses. I thought about uh, linking this passage with what is to follow uh, as we see that famous appeal in verse 28. I love that appeal, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I thought about linking it with that. There's just too much in these verses. And uh, so rather than biting off more than I can chew, uh, we will just look at these verses here tonight. In verse number 20, we read these words. Then began he to abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, court sin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the works which were done to you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repent, repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, the day of judgment, than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And so tonight, we're going to consider Christ's condemnation of Capernaum and uh, the price of rejecting the king. Well, let's go to prayer. Father, I come to you this evening. I just pray, Lord, a blessing as we enter into your word. Lord, help us to understand the truths uh, in this passage. Lord, speak to our hearts. Um, Lord, I, I pray that this passage would alert anyone who may be here tonight that has not received Christ. Lord, that has not repented at that invitation to come to Christ. And, and Lord, that they would act even this evening. I pray, Father, that your word would just uh, appeal to them. And, and Lord, I pray that it also touch the heart of, of, the, of the believer. Lord, we, we look in these verses and we see what awaits um, for those that reject. And, and Father, I just pray that it would move us uh, to prayer. Lord, move us to proclaim the truth. And uh, Lord, help us. Help us to understand the truths here. Apply them to our hearts and uh, use them in our lives tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, again, in Matthew chapter number 11, we're, we see the scripture that's before us. And uh, just kind of taking these verses as a whole, the first thing we want to note is the context. Even before we get into these verses, Jesus describes the people, the people that he had come to minister to. And earlier in Matthew chapter 11, the, the most recent thing that uh, we've been looking at is the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one that prepared the way and uh, brought the nation and preached that same message, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. He pointed the nation to Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And and uh, he said that, of course, Jesus is coming. He's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That was the message of John the Baptist. 
But as we looked in this passage of Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 16 again, when Jesus speaks to this generation, to these people that he's been preaching to, and the people of Israel, he says, whereunto shall I liken this generation? He says, it's like unto children sitting in the markets, calling to their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you, we have not danced, we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. It says it doesn't matter what the message is, it doesn't matter what the approach is, you won't respond. John the Baptist, Jesus says in verse 18, he came neither eating or drinking. He wasn't one that you would find in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the feast days. He wasn't one that was uh, you know, rubbing shoulders in the villages. John the Baptist went out and he was preaching in the wilderness. You remember? That's the way that John operated. And uh, so he was calling them to repentance. We know he was uh, clothed in the, uh, that, that leather belt and the camel hair. And, and he was just a rugged, a, a rugged hillbilly sounding kind of guy, right? That's the way that John was. And uh, John preached. But what do they say about John? As one that was set apart, they said of him, he has a devil. There's something wrong with him. That guy's got to be demon possessed. Well, Jesus was the opposite. Jesus came into the villages. Jesus sat down. He partook uh, of those feast days. Jesus was right there with them day after day. And what do they say about Jesus? They say, oh, he's a, a drunkard and, and a glutton. That's what they say about Jesus because they, they were looking, no matter how the Lord appealed to them, would it be through the, the, the method of Jesus Christ coming to them in their midst, or whether it was John out in the wilderness calling them to repentance, that the, the message was the same, but no matter how it was presented, the people had an excuse. They would not repent. And so Jesus, in, the, in that context, brings us here to these cities. And the cities, Jesus here in verse 21 to verse 24, he mentions three cities of Galilee. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. And these cities had a unique place in all of history. In fact, these cities were privileged cities. The ones who were recipients of a front row seat to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. How many times in your life have you not thought, boy, what would it have been like to hear Jesus preach? What would it have been like to be there the day that Jesus fed the 5,000? What would it have been like to just have a day with Jesus? Well, here's people that had that opportunity. Here's people that knew Jesus, not just by the word, but they knew Jesus Christ in their interactions with him. They, they saw Jesus. They could, you know, we have so many today that will try to paint a portrait of Jesus. Nobody can do that. Leonardo da Vinci doesn't know what Jesus looks like, all right? And that's a whole bunch of nonsense. But these people did. They could paint you a picture of Jesus. And more than just what he looked like, to hear his words, to see his works, to know him. They had that privilege. Matthew chapter 4, and verses 12 to 16, it says, Jesus departed into Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He came and dwelt in Capernaum. He abode there. He dwelt there. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of, of Nephthali, and by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Here's what it says about what Capernaum was. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And it says Capernaum were the recipients of that prophecy. It was fulfilled in their midst. And so Jesus mentions these three cities of Galilee. In these verses, verses 21 to 24, he not only mentions three cities of Galilee, he also mentions three pagan cities. Not cities of Israel, but pagan cities. Two of them were there in uh, well-known and operating in the day in which Jesus was ministering. In fact, Jesus himself visited the coast, maybe even going into the cities, of Tyre and Sidon. And, and this is something that is, is interesting. Jesus went there, uh, maybe into the cities. He was certainly in the coast. But these were ones outside the household of Israel. These were ones that were seafaring people. They were wealthy. They were Phoenicians, is how we would know them in history. 
uh, probably also maybe related down the line from the Philistines. All right, that's who these people were. And Jesus had some ministry there. Um, they would have been counted, however, as an abomination to the Jews. The Jews would have looked at these people as wicked sinners, worthy recipients of the judgment of God. That's these cities of Phoenicia. In fact, those two cities, Tyre and, and Sidon, these two had prophecies leveled against them by the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets said that they were going to be wiped out, and, and just as was prophesied, so it happened. Not by the time of Jesus, but thereafter. At the time of Christ, they're awaiting destruction. So the Jews, when they thought of, of Tyre, they thought wicked, pagan. That's the cities. All right? And not just Tyre and Sidon, but notice also in this passage he references a third city. One that was not in existence in the days in which Jesus preached. One that had been destroyed and stands as a testament in all of history even to this day. And that is the city of Sodom. Sodom stands out because Sodom was so wicked that God judged it with fire from heaven. I think it was just within the last year. Um, archaeologists found the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they say these cities were destroyed by flame. Of course, you know the way the skeptics are. They say after they were destroyed, maybe by, by volcanic eruption, then the legend of Genesis grew out of that as to why they were destroyed. Anything but accepting, hey, look, the Bible says they're destroyed by fire. They were destroyed by fire. Repent! No, that's not the human heart, is it? There's a constant rebellion against God. But these cities have been found. Sodom was destroyed by fire. And why? We read the story in Genesis. As the Lord there came to Abraham, it says the men of Sodom were evil and wicked exceedingly. And so when Jesus brings these cities up in the Jewish mind with the people that are around him, what are they going to think about these, about these places? Wicked, abominable people who are worthy of God's judgment. By the way, that's an accurate assessment. But notice in this passage the condemnation that Jesus gave to those cities of Galilee. It was no doubt a shock to those that heard him. And Jesus denounced these three cities of Galilee as being worthy of greater punishment from God than those pagan cities were. Again, it says in verse number 23, he says, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, you're the recipients of the prophecy to you. There's shown this great light. It says, if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day because they would have repented. But you have not. And so he says in verse 24, he says to Capernaum, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the judgment than for thee. Wow. Wow. It's interesting. Jesus here in these verses prophesied judgment, pronounced woe. Verse 21, on these three Galilean cities. And one thing that you will note is that you'll find many of the cities of the New Testament still in Israel today. You can go to Bethlehem. You can go to Jerusalem. You can go to other Galilean cities like Nazareth. But you can't go to Capernaum. It's gone. Destruction came just as Jesus foretold. And not only in the here and now, but the final judgment awaits. Now you notice in this passage, the Savior. And there's some false teaching about Jesus. Um, and one thing that I, I think that we see in our modern society is they try to paint an image of Jesus that is contradictory to the, to, to the true Jesus that we find in the Word of God. Um, there, there's numerous ignorant attempts to undermine the Word of God. Um, I hear some people say, and ask questions like this. Do you worship the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament? Has anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. As though there is some difference. As though, and, and what, they, what they imply is that the God of the Old Testament is angry and unmerciful and so judgmental. Whereas the God of the New Testament is grace 
and love. Uh, some others will say things like, uh, in fact, there was a church in town that once put on their church sign, Jesus never judged anyone and neither do we. Cl clearly, they haven't read the Bible. Um, and clearly, they, <laughs> they do not know themselves. Um, everyone judges. You're judging me right now. I hope that you're judging me right now. Um, judging the message that I'm preaching right? If you don't judge things, then you're a fool, right? If a complete stranger walked up to your door and said, hey, uh, I'm in town, and uh, I, I, I'm going to let you and your wife go out uh, for an evening uh, dinner, and I'll babysit the kids. I hope you have a little bit of judgment. I hope you say, no, I don't, I don't know you. You're a stranger. Get out of here. I'm not going to trust my kids to you. <gasps> That's judging. You bet it is. Judge righteous judgment. That's the exhortation. You know, we, we have so much foolishness in our society. Um, and so many times people say, well, that's judging. Well, that's judging. You judged my judging, right? There's so much nonsense in our society today. Jesus didn't judge him. Yet, imagine telling the, the people of Capernaum that in the judgment. Well, you know, Capernaum, Jesus never judged anybody. How do you think they would respond? Are you kidding me? Did you hear what Jesus said about us? Was Jesus judgmental? Yeah. Righteous judgment. Now, I understand. There's a wrong judgment. There's the hypocritical judgment. There is a judgment that seeks to condemn rather than to help. That's why Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. That's why he asked the question, why do you behold the beam in your brother, uh, the, the splinter in your brother's eye, and, and you're not taking care of the beam in your own eye? First, take care of the beam so that then you can see clearly to take care of that little speck, that moat in your brother's eye. But he asked the question, why? What's your purpose in doing this? It's not that we're not to judge. We have to judge. You're judging right now. Like I said, you're, you're taking what I'm saying and you're either on the inside saying, yep, that's true. Uh, maybe on the inside you're saying, I wish it wouldn't belabor this point. Move on. I got it. Uh, but you are making judgments. And that's what we're called to do. Just judge according to the right standard, right? But that's the false teaching. The Old Testament God's different than the New Testament God. Jesus doesn't judge. But we look at these passages, and the reality is, in both the Old and New Testament, we meet God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who is holy and just and righteous, and one who will not at all acquit the wicked. At the same time, we meet a God who is full of grace and truth, who loves the world. Jesus and God, Jesus is God, and He is not either or when it comes to being just or merciful. It is not either or with God and being holy or loving. He is at all times perfect in His justice. He is at all times perfect in His mercy. He is not lacking. He is not out of balance. You and I struggle with this. We struggle with this because we're not God. Our God does not struggle. By the way, think of the Old Testament. Was God gracious in the Old Testament? Yeah. I mean, look at the city of Nineveh. Wicked Assyrians. And God could have just, and by the way, would God have been just in just destroying them like he did Sodom? Would he have been just in just sending that flame? The answer is yes. They were wicked people. And yet God in his mercy sent a prophet. And when that wicked king of Nineveh believed the message and repented and put on that sackcloth and ashes and the whole city repented before God, God spared wicked Nineveh. That's the Old Testament. Is it not in the Old Testament where we find ones like Rahab, a harlot? And yet God not only rescues her, spares her, but then includes her in the lineage of the Messiah? What grace is that? This is Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, do we not read in the New Testament of Jesus again and again warning of a lake of fire? 
Yeah, there's a lot of grace in the New Testament, but boy, there's a lot of warning in the New Testament. Is it not in the New Testament where Jesus declared that if your eye offends you, if it's your eye that's keeping you from getting right with God, pull out your eye? Better to go into life eternal with one eye than having both eyes to enter into the, 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 the lake of fire where the worm dies not and the fire's not quenched? Wasn't that Jesus? Isn't it in the New Testament where we find Paul writing? The Lord, when he returns, will be taking vengeance with flaming fire? Question, is the God of the Old and the God of the New Testament different? No. That's just the foolish, sinful human heart. God's God. He does not change. There are no inconsistencies in him. Perfect in holiness, full of grace, righteous yet merciful, just yet loving, I think all of this is perfectly encapsulated in 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9, where it says, The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you see, that long-suffering can be exhausted to where judgment must come. Jesus said to the church in Revelation that He gave them space to repent, and they repented not. And so judgment must fall. And so as we look in this passage, we can learn a great deal about our Savior. That He is not one who overlooks sin. No, Jesus doesn't just overlook sin. Jesus came and gave Himself for that sin. That it would be judged in Him on the cross. And He would rise again and command all men everywhere, as Paul says, to repent. And to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Notice the third thing in this passage and that is the sin. Notice the sin that is so great. Because one thing that you have to gather from this passage is, well, what, was, what was it that was so horrible of Capernaum? Again, there's a comparison here. It must have been a shock to the hearers to hear these things, those that heard Jesus on that day. For the Jews, for them to be compared to the pagans like Tyre and Sidon and the reprobates of Sodom, it would have felt like such an insult. But they were not merely compared. They were told their sin was greater. They counted themselves as superior, especially morally, but Jesus rebukes that notion and tells them they face a greater judgment. And we notice then the corruption. What was it? And that was this. They were recipients of perhaps the greatest light the world has ever received but they rejected Jesus. As I started off the message, you know, we in our lives have thought, what would it have been like to have heard Jesus? They, they did. What would it have been like to see Jesus heal? They did. What would it have been like to, to just observe Jesus day after day? And they had that privilege. Great light. And they rejected it. The greatest sin that any human can commit is rejecting great light. That's what this passage is teaching. The greater the light that we have from God, the greater the responsibility. And this is a concept that's throughout the Word of God. We see it in the New Testament, even conveyed in the truth, where Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is will be required. Now, did Sodom have light? Yeah, they had some light. But they didn't have the light that Capernaum did. And so Jesus says in the judgment, it'll be worse for Capernaum. This is applicable not only to the people of Galilee in the days of Jesus, but it's applicable to Americans today. I believe that America as a nation and Americans as individuals face a greater judgment because we have enjoyed great light. It's something that causes me to fear a little bit when I think of young people that I've known, grown up in Christian homes, grown up in Bible-believing churches that reject it and go out and live for the devil. And there's a terrible reality to that. They had great light, 
They had great privileges that others did not enjoy. And yet they rejected it. There's a consequence. We notice it in this passage. Punishment, judgment will come on these cities. And when they stand at the great white throne, notice again, verse 24, don't miss this. When he comes to the lake of fire, when he comes to the consequences that they suffer eternally, that the city of Capernaum would suffer more than the city of Sodom. This is something that people don't understand. There are degrees of punishment in hell. Some will suffer more than others. You say, well, how is that possible? I don't know. But Jesus says it's so. Jesus says that it's so. It's interesting in the book of Hebrews, in a somewhat similar passage, parallel thoughts, in the book of Hebrews, the question is asked of how much sorer punishment shall he be thought worthy in that passage of those who willfully turn away from the truth. When they've had their understanding given to them. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is, in the book of Hebrews, he's the fulfillment of all of that Old Testament picture. All the sacrifices, Jesus is the summation, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the Messiah. They have the understanding, and yet they will not believe. They turn away, just like Israel at the precipice of the, of the land of promise, turning away, not, be, not believing God. And so for those Hebrews, those Jews who turned away, the writer of Hebrews says, of how much sore punishment shall they be worthy of? It says in Hebrews 10, there's nothing left for them but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. When you know the truth and you reject it, when you know that Jesus died and rose again, And that He is God's plan of redemption. And you choose something else. And you reject His offer. You have committed the greatest sin. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we look in this passage and we see the terrible consequence. Let's consider then the seriousness of all of this. Jesus says in verse 21, and he uses a word here that is one that is uh, repeated throughout the Old Testament prophets. Jesus himself fulfilled the position of a prophet. He, of course, was much more than a prophet, but he was prophet. And he pronounced, notice verse 21, woe. Woe. It's such a foreboding word. In Isaiah In chapter number 5, he pronounced six woes upon the nation of Israel because of their sins against the Lord. One of those woes is very familiar. We quote it often. Woe unto them who call good evil and evil good. We're familiar with that one, right? It's a foreboding word of impending doom. And that's what Jesus here utters to these cities. Woe. And so with it, we find in this verse um, that there is a, a warning. And the warning of all of this for us as we read it, why is this recorded for us? Well, it's to warn us. Warn us to fear God. Is God to be feared? Yes. The sinner should tremble before a holy God. As somebody recently telling me, yeah, you know, my... My counts against God, you can't number them. I've I've sinned too many times. But he doesn't tremble in the least. Like, you don't get it. Do you understand what you have done? Do you understand who it is you've offended? Do you understand who it is you're going to stand before? Again, if we sinned against our local government... We'd fear being apprehended by the police. We wouldn't want to stand before the judge. What's he going to do to me? He's got my life in his hands. If we sinned against the U.S. government, we'd go into hiding, right? We wouldn't want to get caught. What are they going to do to me? They've got my life in their hands. Well, when you sin against God, who's got your eternity in his hands, how awful is that? 
Look at what Jesus had said just a chapter earlier in Matthew chapter number 10 and verse 28, where Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Don't fear man. Don't fear governments. He says, rather, fear him, singular. There's only one. Which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is clear. Fear God. There's a warning. There ought to be a great fear of God. I think if there's one thing that's transpired in America that's a complete 180 from where our nation once was, it's this. There's no fear of God. The Scripture teaches the transgression of the wicked saith that there's no fear of God before their eyes. Now the lost, they need to understand this. The wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Again, our Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there is a point where that space to repent is passed. And judgment not only must fall, judgment will fall. One of the tragedies of the indoctrination of our children into evolution is its attempts to hide them, not just from creation, but to keep our children from understanding the flood. The flood. The testimony of the flood's everywhere. Not just in the Word of God, but all about us. You can see it in the Grand Canyon. You can see it just about anywhere that rock has been carved out. It's the effects of the flood. But even more, you see the flood in the fossil record. And what's the testimony regarding the flood in the fossil record? Death is the testimony. Judgment. That's what the flood says. The righteous judge will judge the earth. The evolutionists talk about the Cambrian explosion. It's a supposed time where the fossil record had very few life forms, and then all at once there's an explosion of fossils. All of a sudden, just this, suddenly there's, there's, there's thousands, millions of fossils where before there was just a few. And they offer the interpretation that that's where life was taking off. But that's a perversion. What they've actually discovered is the results of the flood. There's a reason there was an explosion of rapidly buried and fossilized organisms. It's because there was that global flood. You know, the thing is, though evolutionists, as pawns in the hands of Satan, try to hide the truth, and while they attempt to undermine the truth in this nation, yet America knows the truth. Do Americans know about the flood? Yeah. In fact, I would even say the majority of Americans not only know about the flood, but they know the why of the flood. I think most can tell you. Why did God flood the earth? Well, Because mankind was so evil that He sent the flood. They may not believe it, but they can tell you about it. The thing is, our leaders know, our people know, God will judge sin, for God must judge sin. He's the righteous judge of all the earth. He will uphold His laws. Our government may make laws that they don't enforce, but our God does not. A child of God, we've got to understand this. We've got to understand these truths. First of all, rest assured, God will not be mocked. Asaph looked at the prosperity of the wicked, and when he saw the prosperity of the wicked in his day, what does he say? He says, I almost fell. You know, here's these people, they don't serve God. God doesn't even enter into any of their thoughts. And yet, look at their life, just going along. It seems like they've got all that their heart could wish for. But we see that today in America. We see perverse people that just seem to live without any care at all. They seem to have everything. But they don't have the most important thing. Asaph said when he saw that, he said, I was envious He says, until I went into the sanctuary and what? 
He said, then I understood their end. I understood what awaits them. You know, for us, as we look at these verses in verses 20 to 24, we're reminded of the truth. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man, woman, town, city, nation, whatsoever it soweth, that shall it also reap. And so for the child of God, we, re- we, we recognize these truths, and, and God will do what's right. But we also have to have the heart of Jesus. Jesus pronounced woe not just on these cities, but also on Jerusalem. And when Jesus pronounced those words, we know on that instance, He wept. He wept. Even in the Old Testament, it tells us the Lord does not have pleasure in the death of the wicked. He will uphold the law. He will punish the evildoer. But He wants him to repent. And so as we look in this passage, we find what should our heart be? The Apostle Paul's was this. In Colossians, it says that he preached, warning every man. Jude tells us to save some with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There's a hell. It's real. We find in this passage, though, the solution. What does he say in verse number 20? What was the issue? He tells us, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. That was the call. That was the message. Repent. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. And what is it to repent? Well, that's the Greek word metanoia. It means to have a changed mind, literally after mind. It's to stop seeing ourselves as good in the eyes of God. It's it's to stop uh, seeing um, 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 ourselves as being able to earn our way to God. It's, It's to start seeing ourselves like the thief did on that day when he cried out to Jesus from the cross. And he said, look, we're getting what we deserve. We suffer justly. We're getting the due reward of our deeds. This is his assessment of himself And then in that repentance, he did what? He looked at Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And so a a repentance is that 180 within your heart where you are going this way and saying, I'm going to save myself or I love my sin. I'm going to pursue my sin. But in your heart, it's that 180 to say, no, I need Jesus. It's not works. There's fruits of repentance. But repentance, like faith, is something without works. It leads to works, but it's to turn from that unbelief to belief in Jesus. The Bible speaks of repentance toward God and faith faith toward Jesus Christ. That was the message of the Apostle Paul. Again, great example, the thief on the cross. I'm a guilty sinner, but Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in that faith and in that request, Jesus gave him that promise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Again, he tells us in this passage, if Sodom had heard the message, it would remain. If those pagan cities had heard the message, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And those were the fruits of repentance. We notice in this passage, one of the things in sackcloth and ashes that's baked into repentance is this. Humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We have to humble ourselves and become like a little child if we would enter into the kingdom. Coming not on our own merits, but coming humbly depending on Jesus and His grace. And so it is for us. Look, yes, it's salvation. There must be repentance, but throughout our lives we live out that same repentance. Not trusting self, 
not pursuing the things of this earth, but turning to Christ and following after Him. And it's all about humility versus pride. Now, now's the time. Again, in this passage, when Jesus pronounced these woes, Capernaum's opportunities were passing. And today we know they're past. For us, the opportunity is now. I remind you in Mark chapter 1, it's verses that I often will use with people who are lost, where Jesus made this statement in Mark chapter 1, in verse number 15. And uh, the demands that he made then, he still makes today. Uh, Mark 1, 15, Jesus made this statement. He said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. That's the message. That's how you exit that kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of God. Only by such faith. Again, tonight we look at this passage. We see Christ's condemnation of Capernaum. Uh, Jesus is the righteous judge. There is much to be feared if you don't know him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because when we fear God's wrath, we run into the arms of Jesus. Save me. Even John the Baptist looked at those people that came out to him and he said what? O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Even now, the Lord stands as we see at the end of the chapter with his arms open. Come unto me. Come to me. I'll give you rest. I'm so glad today that the invitation is open. Whosoever, whosoever, that's what he says again and again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever believeth on him will not perish but have everlasting life. And so tonight, if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want you to understand if you've rejected, there is judgment. And if you've had a lot of light, and you still haven't been saved, and you put it off tonight, your judgment is just getting worse. That's why it's time now, as the Bible says, to come to Jesus. Lord, save me. Today. Today. For now is the accepted time, and now is the day of salvation. And Christian, what about those around us? that are lost and on their way to hell. You know, we've got a society that tells them over and over again, there's nothing to fear. They've painted a picture of God that's a lie. They speak lies such as, we're all God's children. And it's not true. You know the truth. You say, yeah, but they don't like to hear the truth. Well, we've been given a message and sent out by our king. It really comes down to, will we obey our king? Will we seek to please him or seek to please the people around us? Speak the truth. Warn them about that place. Jesus did. We don't hear it enough today, do we? I think I saw only 30% of Americans believe there's such a place as hell. One day, it'll be 100%. And that's reality. And so again, how then shall we live? What do we do with this? I think these truths preach themselves. There's people on your heart, people in your life that you know. If they died right now, you don't know where they'd go. Well, that's a terrible feeling. So while you have the opportunity, speak the truth in love. Do what Jesus did. 
and leave the results to God. They may get mad at you, or it may be in the end they come to you and they say, thank you. Where would I be if you hadn't spoken? And if it's not you, then who? If it's not us, who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell Northport if it's not First Baptist Church? Well, we've got a responsibility. Let's pray. Father, I come to you tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help us with these truths. Lord, if there is one in our midst that is not saved, Lord, that tonight you would burden them. See what's at stake with their eternity. Oh, Lord, I pray that they would repent and believe on Jesus, trusting Him to forgive them of their sin. Father, help them even tonight. I pray, Lord, by Your grace, by Your Spirit, that You would convict of sin. Bring them understanding, Lord. Bring them to that precipice. Oh, Lord, I pray that You would burden the hearts of Your people Lord, to read through a passage like this, Lord, just to read it, Lord, it's got to stir us. It's got to break our hearts. Lord, we've grown so cold and apathetic. Father, revive us. Help us to see what is on the line. Lord, help us to see the souls of men and women are at stake. Father, may we be like Christ as we were created in Christ Jesus to be. Lord, may we be like Him in warning and speaking the truth in love. Help us, Father, tonight. Bless your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.